Good morning. We will continue with Albert Camus's The Fall, uh, novel are written in 1956. Uh, four things that we must consider, the setting, the characters, the theme, the technique. Setting is uh, a cold winter night in Amsterdam. Uh, the characters are having a conversation first uh, in a bar, uh, which is called Mexico City in Amsterdam. Uh, the characters, Jean Baptiste Clemens, he is the speaker. There is an unidentifiable uh, silent interlocutor, a listener. The theme is the absurdity of human existence. The hypocrisy of the middle class. the cynicism and indifference of the bourgeois. How they devote, how the middle class devotes its life, uh, their lives to um, uh, the pursuits of sensual pleasures and uh, remain unconcerned with the larger issues of life, the larger themes of life, their absolute refusal to accept responsibilities for the horrors of uh, uh, the, the holocaust, yeah, the atrocities caused by the Nazis. So, their absolute refusal, the absolute uh, to accept responsibility, they are living in denial that is, those are the major concerns of uh, the fall. The technique as we were talking is confessional. You have one speaker going on you know, talking about his uh, uh, life, his experience, his concerns, his social concerns, his moral concerns and you have a silent listener. Many people have believed that uh, or just conjured that uh, the silent listener could uh, as well be um, God, God himself. But there is a question mark, is he talking to God? Is he talking to a priest during his confession? Okay. So, this technique uh, which is an improvement on the famous dramatic monologue, which was uh, perfected uh, by the Victorian uh, poets like Robert Browning and Tennyson. So, um, this is uh, as we were just talking about it just goes a step further from that technique and uh, uh, it has been uh, used by several writers down the over the uh, over the years. One important uh, um, uh, novelist is Mohsin Hamid, an Asian American novelist settled in uh, New York who wrote his the relic fundamentalist. In almost the same uh, manner, which is a confessional uh, tone, adapting a confessional tone, where there is a silent listener, who just goes on listening to the uh, speaker. The speaker goes on and on about uh, um, the life of uh, uh, a Muslim in the present day New York, in present day America, especially after the 9-11 tragedy. Okay. So, that is also written in the same, uh, following the same technique as the falls. We will continue uh, page 12. Holland is a dream, a dream of gold and smoke, smoke here by day more gilded by night, and night and day the dream is peopled with Lohengrins like these, dreamily riding their black bicycles with high handle bars, 
funeral songs constantly drifting throughout the whole country, around the seas, along the canals. Their heads in their copper colored clouds, they dream, they ride in circles, they pray, sleepwalking in the fog's gilded incense, they have ceased to be here, they have gone thousands of miles away. So, the essential indifference of the middle class Europeans towards the atrocities of the times, of their times. So, uh, they live uh, like characters from a Wagnerian opera, uh, that is the reference to Lohan Grins. It is almost as if they are living uh, a life of opera, the reality outside does not matter to them. They live as if they live in a, in a state of dream, in a state of denial, surrounded by their sensual pleasures, uh, which uh, Camus compares uh, with uh, almost like existing in hell, all smoke and gold. But I am letting myself go, I am pleading a case, forgive me, uh, forgive me, habit, vocation, also the desire to make you fully understand this city and the heart of things. We are at the heart of things here. Have you noticed that Amsterdam's concentric canals resemble the circles of hell? This is um, a reference to uh, Dante's The Divine Comedy, where he describes uh, hell as a, uh, as a concentric of circles. Uh, the middle class hell, of course, peopled with bad dreams. When one comes from the outside, as one gradually goes through the, those circles, life and hence its crimes becomes denser, darker. And here we are in the last circle, the circle of, ah, you know that, by heaven you become harder to classify. There is a response, but uh, we the readers are not told what that response is. It is almost like uh, whatever the, uh, the listener says. It be, it's muted for us. It's only for the ears of um, the speaker, Jean Baptiste Clemens. We, as uh, as readers, we are not privy to this conversation. That means to to the exchange, whatever comes from the speaker, the listener, we do not get to hear that. Now you know that by heaven, sorry, by heaven you become harder to classify. But you understand then why I can say that to the center of things is here, although we stand at the tip of the continent. A sensitive man grasps such oddities. In any case, the newspaper readers uh, and the fornicators can go farther. They come from the four corners of Europe and stop facing the inland sea on the drab strand. They listen to the fog horns, vainly try to make out the silhouettes of boats in the fog, then turn back over the canals and go home through the rain. Chill to the bone, they come and ask in all, all languages for gin at Mexico City. That is where I wait for them. So, this is interesting. Uh, these people who come from all over um, Europe, they, they are cold, chill to the bone. Okay not just physically cold, but emotionally, spiritually cold as well. Okay. And all they do is uh, live a life of dreadful monotony, a life of denial, okay. a life with very little or um, absolutely no concern for others. And that is where the writer or that is where the speaker waits for them. Till tomorrow then and share compatriot, that my dear um, fellow traveler. No, you will easily find your way now. I leave you near this bridge. I never cross a bridge at night. It's because of a vow. Suppose after all that someone should jump in the water. One of two things, either you follow suit to fish him out and in cold weather that is taking a great risk or you forsake him there and to suppress a dive sometimes uh, leaves one strangely aching. Good night. What? Those ladies behind those windows dream, monsieur, cheap dream, a trip to the Indies. Those persons perfume themselves with spices. 
you go in, they draw the curtains and the navigation begins. The gods come down onto the naked bodies and the islands are set adrift, lost souls crowned with the tussled hair of palm trees in the wind. Try it. And that is how the first chapter ends, very teasingly, what if somebody decides to end their lives by jumping down the uh, bridge into the river. Uh, you are left only with two options, either you have to jump in the cold water to rescue them or just walk away. Uh, both are uh, not very comfortable, you see, when you jump in the cold water, you inconvenience yourself. If you do not jump, and then you are burdened with some sort of guilt okay. and uh, uh, the narrator obviously does not want to be saddled with either of the two choices. So, this is again a very existentialist point of view, although Camus always denied being an existentialist in the uh, conventional sen uh, sense, in the Sartrean sense, but uh, many people regard him as one of the uh, key philosophers of the existentialist movement of the philosophy. Okay, we will continue with the second uh, chapter. What is a judge penitent? Now, this is uh, very interesting. A judge, he calls himself a judge penitent. You know what a judge is. A judge is someone who judges others. Conventionally speaking, traditionally speaking, a, uh, you have a, a court of law where a judge decides, he presides over cases and gives his verdict. Okay. So, a judge is somebody who is appointed to pass on judgment on somebody. Penitent, however, is somebody who has sinned, who has done some wrong. So, judge, that is his identity, judge hyphen penitent. Okay. So, he does not have a singular or a unique identity. He is a combination of the two. He is, a, he is a judge as well as a penitent. He has sinned as well as judged others for sinning. Okay. Ah, I intrigued you with that little matter. Now, what is judge penitent and uh, the listener finds it, uh, finds it very interesting, very intriguing. I meant no harm by it, believe me, and I can explain myself more clearly. In a manner of speaking, it is really one of my official duties, but first I must set forth a certain number of facts that will help you to understand my story. A few years ago, I was a lawyer in Paris. So, gradually as we were talking about the theme, uh, sorry, the technique, confessional dramatic monologue. Gradually, you find the speaker revealing about himself, self-revelation is at the core of uh, any dramatic monologue. So, he was a lawyer in Paris and indeed a rather well known lawyer. So, he was a very successful lawyer. Of course, I did not tell you my real name. I used to specialize in noble cases, the widow and orphan as the saying goes. I do not know why, because uh, there are uh, widows who cheat and orphans who are quite savage. Yet, it was enough for me to sniff the slightest scent of victim on a defendant for me to swing into action and what action? A real tempest. My heart was on my sleeve. You really might have thought that justice slept with me every night. I am sure you would have admired uh, the accuracy of my tone, the appropriateness of my emotion, the persuasion and warmth, the restrained indignation of my speeches before the court. Nature has favored me as to my physique and the noble attitude comes effortlessly. Furthermore, I was buoyed up by two sincere feelings, the satisfaction of being on the right side of the bar and an instinctive scorn for judges in general. That scorn, after all, was not perhaps so 
instinctive, I know now that it had its reasons, but seen from the outside, it appears to be more like a passion. Now, um, consider the way he describes himself. and what action, look at the language and what action, a real tempest. As a lawyer, he was able to raise quite a storm okay, and he was able to perform. So, uh, this, this is also uh, a very intriguing commentary on the performative aspect. of human life, of any profession. We are all performers. Okay. Nature has um, bestowed upon him uh, many bounties. For example, he says, he, has, he, was best, uh, he was blessed with a good physique, he had um, a very persuasive tone, he could use a persuasive tone, he had a grand demeanor, um, he was overall an extremely impressive personality and he used it to the hilt. As a lawyer, he uh, could perform well to perfection uh, inside a court and that is how he became popular and successful. So, it is also um, the innate duplicity, the innate uh, 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 mendacity of human character that Camus is talking about. We all uh, put on a mask, we all perform all the time. I could not understand, however, how uh, a man could set himself up to perform such a surprising function. I accepted the fact because I saw it, but rather as I accepted locus. This is another uh, biblical allusion, uh, acceptance of locus around us. With this difference that uh, the invasions of those orthoptera never brought me a sieve, whereas I earned my living by carry on, uh, carrying on dialogues with people I scorned. So, he hated judges, that is what he says, St uh, but still he, t he treats them like locusts, like pests, but still he carry, he made his living, he, a very successful, very impressive living by conversing, by uh, carrying on dialogue with people he hated. But after all, I was on the right side, that was enough to assure my peace of conscience, the feeling of the law the satisfaction of being right, the joy of self-esteem, shame are powerful incentives to keep up, keep us upright or make us move forward. On the other hand, if you deprive men of them, you transform them into dogs frothing with rage. How many crimes committed merely because their authors could not endure being wrong? I once knew a businessman who had a perfect wife admired by all and yet he deceived her. That man was literally enraged to be in the wrong, to be cut off from receiving or granting himself a certificate of virtue. The more virtues his wife displayed, the more vexed he became. Eventually living in the wrong became unbearable to him. What do you think he did then? He gave up deceiving her? Not at all, he killed her. That is how I came to have dealing with him. Uh, so, uh, this is an exploration of uh, the, you know, the, the distorted human psyche. One always resents uh, people who are virtu more virtuous than uh, they are. And this man has a wife who accepted uh, her husband's faults, uh, his indiscretions, his adulteries and all. Uh, uh, with a smile, she never uh, questioned him and he hated her all the more for that. And what did he do? He ends up murdering her and the case comes to John Baptist Clements. My situation was more enviable. Not only did I run a no risk of joining the criminal camp, in particular I had no chance of killing my wife being a bachelor, but I even took up their defence on the sole condition that they should be noble murders, just as others are noble savages. 
the very manner in which I conducted that defense gave me great satisfaction. So, that is how he defended um, the accused people that uh, uh, this was a crime of passion, the, those were those murders happened or were done because the murderer uh, uh, was in a you know, you know it is a crime of passion in a fit of some kind of a righteous rage, he killed those people. Otherwise, uh, at heart he is a noble person and that became his defense. I was truly above reproach in my professional life. So, he was extremely self satisfied personally as well as professionally. Um, I never accepted a bribe, it goes without saying, nor again did I ever stoop to any shady proceedings. And this is even rarer, I nev never deigned to flatter any journalist to get him on my side, nor any civil servant whose friendship might be useful to me. I even had the luck to see the legion of honor offered to me two or three times and to be able to refuse it with a discreet dignity. Um, see, people usually remember those who refuse great honors. Uh, people, if someone refuses Nobel Prize or um, some any other award of excellence, they are more remembered than people who actually receive the uh, prize, the much coveted prize. So, that is uh, in refusal also what he is trying to be is uh, to become is more uh, significant, more visible. So, uh, there is an inner co contradiction in the character of Jean Paul as uh, Jean Baptiste Clemens and that is what uh, Camus is intrigued about. The hypocrisy of human nature refusing an award, so that they become more popular. Um, in which I found my true re reward. Finally, I never charged the poor and never boasted of it. But you can ima already imagine my satisfaction. I enjoyed my own nature to the fullest and we all know that therein lies happiness, although to soothe one another mutually, we occasionally pretend to condemn such joys as selfishness. At least, I enjoyed that part of my nature, which reacted so appropriately to the widow and the orphan, that eventually through exercise, it came to dominate my whole life. His whole life is a lie. That is what uh, uh, we are, we have to understand. Why he did or uh, why uh, he performed all these acts of charity, saving the, uh, helping the widows and the orphans, not because he actually cared about them, because uh, he wants to create an impression that he is uh, a very good person, a very selfless person, but was he? he Camus t tells us that actually Jean Baptiste Clemens is an example of a smug, hypocritical uh, middle class, uh, which has no compunction, uh, compassion for the downtrodden. But why they want to help is in order to earn their gratitude, to earn the gratitude of those uh, they uh, claim to help. Okay. So, in a way, they project themselves as uh, the ultimate in uh, uh, nobility, in sacrifice, in charity, but they are not what they pretend to be. So, it is an attack on the middle class hypocrisy and mendacity. For instance, I love to help blind people cross streets. Now, this is another example of uh, uh, trying to come across as a selfless human being, a, a person with great social responsibility. From as far away as I could see a cane hesitating on the edge of a pavement, the typical scenario of a, a, a blind man trying to cross a road. I would rush forward, sometimes only a second ahead of another charitable hand already outstretched, snatch the blind person from any solicitude but mine, and lead him gently but firmly over the pedestrian crossing amidst the hazards of the traffic towards the quiet haven of the other pavement, where we would separate with a mutual emotion. 
In the same way, I always enjoy telling people the way in the street, giving a light, lending a hand with heavy barrows, pushing a stranded car, buying a paper um, from the Salvation Army girl, a flask from the old woman peddler, um, though I knew she stole them from the Mauparnas cemetery. I also liked, and this is harder to say, I like to give alms. A very Christian friend of mine admitted that one's initial feeling of seeing a beggar approach one's house is unpleasant. Well, with me it was worse, I used to exult, but let us say no more about it. So, all the traditional acts of generosity and charity, he would love to, uh, he would love to do, he would love to participate in the buying a newspaper from an old, uh, from a young child, buying flowers from an old woman. He does not really need flowers, but he would, uh, you know, claim, you know, to help the old lady and buy uh, flowers from her, giving alms to the beggars, helping people cross the street, giving them a hand. Uh, while push, uh, you know, uh, while uh, uh, with he heavy barrows, trying to help people in uh, pushing their stranded cars, all these uh, acts of generosity, all these acts of uh, charity towards fellow human beings, they were performed not out of any inner feeling of goodness, okay, but in order to um, elicit gratitude from people. And this, according to Camus, is a very uh, inauthentic characteristic. Let us speak rather of my courtesy. It was famous and yet beyond question. So, he is a good performer. That is what he has been telling us from the beginning. He performs well before the, uh, before the judge. He performs well before his strangers, um, all kinds of uh, um, people can come and approach him. and ask for favors and he will do that. Um, and it, it would make him feel extremely important. And then his courtesy, his famous courtesy, it was famous and yet beyond question. Indeed, good manners provided me with great delights. If I had the luck on certain mornings to give up my seat in the bus or the underground to someone who obviously deserved it, to pick up some object an old lady had dropped and return it to um, her with a smile, I knew well, or merely to forfeit my taxi to someone in a greater hurry than I, it was a red letter day. I even rejoiced, I must admit, on those days uh, when, because the public transport was on a strike, I had a chance to load into my car at the bus stops some of the unfortunate fellow citizens unable to get home. So, small acts of charity, small acts of kindness, uh, he would do and it would make him feel extremely good about himself. It would make him feel morally superior uh, to other people. Giving, my, uh, giving up my seat in the theatre to allow a couple to sit together, lifting a girl's suitcases on to the rack in a train, these were all deeds I performed more often than others, because I paid more attention to the opportunities and was better able to relish the pleasures they gave. So, this inborn, this innate hypocrisy, uh, which is common to all. Now, this is uh, not just Jean Paul, Bap John Baptist Clemens that is being talked about. It is also the people uh, of our society. They, uh, most of us would in, indulge in such kind, uh, gestures of kindness. Okay, but when it comes to uh, addressing the larger concerns, we are silent. And that is what bothers Camus. It is not helping a girl in uh, lifting her suitcase or helping a blind man cross the street. It is also how you, how well you are connected to people. And what lacks in Jean Baptiste Clemence's character is his inability to actually, inability to get connected to people. That is what is lacking in his character. We will continue. Thank you.